At what point in your parenting journey did you realize that every baby and every child is different? For me, I was terrified that my second baby would have as difficult a feeding journey as my first. Kim has four stories to share of her four boys, and each story is really quite different. She became an IBCLC along the way, and so we also discuss how being an IBCLC impacted her feeding journeys and how her feeding journeys have impacted the care that she gives as an IBCLC. Whether you have one child or multiple children, whether your feeding journeys have been easy or hard, there is something to relate to in this story. So enjoy. I'm Kim Jurest. I own Embracing Lactation. I'm an IBCLC in private practice. I have uh, four boys at home, me and my husband. Um, we live in the Mananoc region of New Hampshire, and I successfully breastfed all of my four kids. We have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, a two-year-old, and a five-month-old. And <laughs> But mm -hmm. really my passion for um, helping infants and infant feeding uh, really came from my second son, Lincoln. My first son, I was very uh, privileged to have a successful breastfeeding journey with him. He latched right away. He was a really fat and chubby baby. And I also did a lot of kind of self-research before having him. So I did try to put that foundation for infant feeding and breastfeeding there. Sometimes I'm like, well, maybe it was that. But then when I had my second and he was just like not really interested in eating, falling off the growth curve, my milk supply wasn't really there. I looked more into like why this was happening. We ended up getting a feeding and swallowing specialist and also a speech specialist. And that was when I learned about tongue and lip ties. I had always heard about them, but I didn't really know too much about them. Um, and so he was diagnosed with a tongue and lip tie at around two years old. Um, and we did, oh, oh. yeah, he was a lot later. Uh, so we struggled even eating. Uh, up until he was like two. So he had trouble swallowing. He was gagging a lot. I uh, didn't really get over that gagging phase. Um, so it was really scary. Like feeding for him was just not fun. So we did have him released at two years old. That was a full procedure. But right when I got him in the car, he was like sticking his tongue out, like moving his mouth all weird. And I could just tell that he felt different. And I mm. immediately was so happy that we did the procedure. And since then, he has had a successful eating journey and is fine. He still is our guy who doesn't eat that much. Like he's not really into food. Um, but he, we don't have any issues with him now. And then when we had our third, he had severe reflux. So that was also mm. during COVID. So we were all at home during that time. And when he was diagnosed with reflux, um, I really decided like I need to look into why this is happening, how this is happening, how I can make this better because breastfeeding with him was really difficult just because he would feed and then throw up and then we would have to get changed and then he'd want to feed again and then we'd have to do the whole thing over again. It was really, really hard. Um, and he ended up having a tongue and lip tie that we did have released when he was a couple weeks old. And that did help some, but really uh, we had help from a feeding and swallowing specialist. Again, a speech specialist, OT, um, really tried to like bring in all of the providers to help us with his situation. Um, and I went back to school online to get my IBCLC. Um, and when things started opening up, I went and did my clinical hours with my mentor for Pathway 3. Uh, yeah, it definitely was a roller coaster. And I feel like in between having some issues with some of my kids. I tried to do my own education and my own search on it. And uh, the reflux though, I still feel like sometimes I have a little bit of PTSD with it just because when any of my kids like either get sick or they're throwing up or something, I'm just like, oh my God, please don't take me back to that time when we were just watching his vomit, it felt like. And 
Oddly enough, we got new washer dryers during that time. And it was, since everything's like automated now, they like hook up to your phone and there's like an app. Um, so I guess what it what they do now is they record how many times a month you do laundry, which I'm not really sure why you'd need that. But um, when we were in- <laughs> Just the, for your own validation. Um, when we were in the thick of the reflux, I did over 50 loads of laundry in one month. And that- when I saw that on my phone, like I just started crying. I just was like, I can't mm. believe that this is like where we are right now. Um, and it's, it, it's definitely real. I feel like reflux is something that also gets brushed under the rug. The same with like lip and tongue ties sometimes. A lot of lactation related stuff just goes, oh, just give it some time and it'll go away. And um, 50 loads of laundry doesn't go away. As someone who just asked my family to give me a round of applause last night for having folded five clean loads of laundry. I can totally relate to this story. So if you are in the endless laundry loop, especially as we're coming into the holidays and you would like to get something off your plate, it's hard to get laundry off your plate, but something you can get off your plate is meals. So take a listen to this ad from my sponsor, Feast and Fettle, and we'll be right back. When I first returned to work, I had no idea how I was going to manage going to work, handling drop-offs and pickups, and doing all the other duties I needed to do, like get dinner on the table. If you are in this situation, I've got a solution for you. Go to feastandfettle.com, where you can select from a menu of delicious options and have home-cooked meals delivered right to your front door. Imagine taking meal planning off your plate taking grocery shopping off your plate for those dinners and knowing that all you have to do is pick up your baby, get home, and heat and serve meals that you have selected for your family. If you live in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, and now Maine, go to feastandfettle.com and use my code MILK, M-I-L-K, to get $30 off your first order. You've got nothing to lose. Yeah. And what's interesting about that is I think a lot of lactation professionals are really passionate about tongue and lip tie. Yet many of us, because we have not educated ourselves about reflux, we tend to be people who will also brush it under the rug or we will say that it, it, and I do think to some extent it gets overdiagnosed by pediatricians because they don't know how to find the root cause of the reflux. And like you were saying, it was potentially tied to tongue and lip tie, although that didn't completely resolve it, did it? No, it didn't. It was, I really think it had something to do with his actual stomach and the sphincter that kind of sits on top of the stomach was just really premature and like underdeveloped. It started to get better when he was closer to 10 months. And we would see him maybe vomiting like a couple times a week instead of it being like after every feeding. And it also happened when he had solids as well. So it wasn't just um, breast milk that he was having trouble with either. Yeah. So I want to take you back a little bit because you mentioned how the first experience you had breastfeeding was blissful in looking back. That's not a word you used, but almost like the perfect experience, would you say? Yes. Yep. He, I had a robust milk supply with him. He latched right away. Um, He is, he was a very tall baby and is still a tall kid. Um, So he was just always really big. And people commented on that saying that, oh, like you must have a great milk supply. Um, And I was kind of naive and didn't quite put two and two together that that's not always the case. Like genetics are also play a part in it. Um, And moving forward, most of my kids were born very tall and long and then like gradually got in the normal range, I guess. Uh, But yeah, he was just such a good eater, like loved solid foods, loved nursing. Definitely a busy guy, though. Once he got to more like six to eight months, he was, uh, it's really hard for me to concentrate on nursing. So we really had to like go in the dark room, you know, take some time to make it the perfect environment for him to settle down. And he's still like that. He still is very go, 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 Um, where uh, I feel like his brother, one of our middle sons, um, 
he could nurse anywhere, but also wasn't really into eating because he had um, the swallowing issue. It was very different. And even going to my pediatrician, I was like, something's not quite right. He's not eating like his brother ate. And I have bookends because our youngest, who's five months old, he's a great nurser, no issues with him. Um, He did have a tongue and lip tie that we did have released, but it wasn't like very tight or anything. Mm -hmm. He did still have one. And I do feel like his nursing journey got much better, but it wasn't like what my two middle sons had. Um, Yeah. They are bookends in the sense that my first um, was really great. And my last one has also been really great too. He's only five months, but still. Yeah. You're already in the groove. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, and I think this is a cautionary tale for people who are trying to figure out why their feeding journeys are so difficult If you go onto a Facebook group, for instance, or you just ask peers, they only have the experiences that they have. Right. And so if every journey for them was difficult or if every journey for them was easy, they are only speaking from that experience. Whereas if you go to a professional like an IBCLC, we're not speaking from our own experience. We're speaking from the research, from all the clients that we've had, from the experience we've had helping many babies at many different stages who have had many different root causes for their difficulty. And so not that I do think peer support can be very valuable, but I do think if you're really having difficulty and you're being blown off by your pediatrician, the place to go is not only the peers because the pool of experience that they're drawing from is just so small and there can be such a wide variety of difficulties. Yes. It's sort of like, I try to explain, um, it as if something was broken on your car, you could maybe go to your neighbor who likes working on cars and be like, hey, like this isn't working. And they could look at it and maybe they'll fix it. Maybe they might break something else. But like what you really should do is take it to the mechanic who like has all this background, did all this research, whatever. Has the diagnostic tools. Exactly. Has the diagnostic tools to... Um, diagnose what's wrong with the vehicle. That visual is sometimes easier for people to understand because sometimes I feel like they still don't know what an IBCLC is or even what that stands for. A lot of times they get the letters a little mixed up and it is a tongue twister, but it's not like routinely suggested. And Definitely some providers do suggest it. And like those providers, it's like, yeah, keep doing that. That's great. But then there's other providers who are like, eh, whatever. like we have lactation consultants um, or lactation consultants, I like to say, in the hospital. You know, and um, the, the only caution about that is they're also doing 50 other things. They're seeing patients delivering babies, whatever it is that they do there and lactation on the back burner that they do, but it's not something that they do all the time for their job. Yeah. So I primarily have a private practice, but I also work at a large teaching hospital in central Massachusetts two days a month. Um, And I work a Saturday and a Sunday so that I can see the same people, hopefully both days. And one of the reasons I decided to do that was because Sometimes I would think, what are these hospital IBCLCs doing? Yeah. But then now that I'm in that situation, I have a lot more compassion because you're really playing triage as a hospital IBCLC. You are not, you know, when we come in as private practice IBCLCs, my visits are usually 90 minutes, the first visit. Sometimes the second visit is shorter than 90 minutes. Sometimes they go over 90 minutes. And that is a long time to get to sit with somebody, observe lots of different feedings talk about various difficulties that you might be having, do some problem solving. It feels slow. It does not feel rushed. Whereas when I'm in the hospital, I might have 12 people I'm supposed to see today. Yeah. Plus nurses calling me for an extra visit that wasn't originally on my list. And so you can only spend, you either say, okay, I'm just going to get the highest quality of time with the most amount of people I can, or you're going to limit the amount of time with each person 
knowing that it's better to see more people. And I honestly don't know which is better. I've I tried know. both in the hospital. Yeah. But if you have only seen a hospital-based IBCLC, the work that they do is critical. Helping families yeah. get started initially is so critical. But I tell every single one of the people I see in the hospital, here's how you find a private practice IBCLC who will come to your house, who can most often bill insurance or provide you a super bill. Like, don't continue to struggle yeah. without getting that help because I can only do so much right here. Right. Plus... Hospital IBCLCs are often bound by policy. Like I cannot really discuss tongue tie with families. I have to be very, very careful because the providers, the pediatricians will get upset if they come into a room and they say lactation told me my baby has a tongue tie. Yeah. It's just a different environment. Yeah. And we need IBCLCs in the hospital setting. We need more of them and we need hospitals to believe in the training that they have. Yes. And believe that they that we are the gold standard of lactation care and until that happens hospital based lactation care won't get better yeah. but that's why if you have seen a hospital based lactation consultant they might be fan they might be fantastic but they are limited by the setting in which they are practicing yeah that's totally true and even with my last birth um was in the hospital and the IBCLC that was our nurse knew that I was also an IBCLC. And she was like, where do you work? What do you, what, do you have a private practice? Like she had all these questions and I was like, yep, I have a private practice, you know, right down the road, yada, yada. And she was like, oh, we need someone who just does lactation in here. And I was like, call me, but like, I'll come over. Um, so it's, and I feel like too, it's been harder for me to get into hospitals because I'm not an RN or an LPN. Um, I am just an IBCLC, but I still feel like that is super, super beneficial. And um, a lot of people think IBCLCs have to be RNs. That's not the case. So it's there's a lot of pieces that sort of are evolving. Um, and I think we're getting close to having a really supportive community. It's just like everything. It just takes time. Um, but that's awesome that you're already like in a hospital. I think that's great. I've been trying to get my feet in there and more, more squeaky wheel. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I would love to know. I always told people, so I didn't, I was a CLC by the time I had my second baby, but I was not an IBCLC. And um, so I did, I hired an IBCLC private practice to come to my house. I had a home birth. So it was a little bit different. I wasn't in that hospital setting where there were people coming in, but I've always said if I were to ever give birth again, which I'm in my forties and that's probably not going to happen. But if I ever were, and I was in a hospital setting, I would not say a word about being an IBCLC because, oh, funny. yeah, because I would just want to get the help without anybody thinking like, oh, you know what you're doing because you can't really be your own IBCLC. Very true. I, I feel, and it's the same as sometimes in the hospital setting, I've had several experiences where the patient was an OBGYN nurse. So she at that same hospital yep. and you see a lot of people saying, oh, you know what you're doing, but honestly, it's different when it's your baby yep. and you're worrying about the baby. So I always, I give the same education to those people as I would to any other person. Yep. And I might say, oh, you probably know this, but I just want to tell you just in, to honor their position, but also to make sure that we're not forgetting to provide the same care to them. So I would love to know what your experience was like as an IBCLC giving birth in a hospital. You mentioned a little bit about that conversation with the nurse, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, that was my second hospital birth. My, our four boys, our three of our boys were born at home. Um, our last one was at the hospital. And so I've had two hospital births. One of them was a surrogate birth. So that baby wasn't ours. And then our last son, he was born at the hospital. So that, um, that hospital, we also utilized pediatrics there. I, my youngest sister was born there. So we've, we've been in flowing circles with that hospital. So 
they knew that I was an IBCLC even when I was like touring, just because I go there all the time. I've spoken openly that I am an IBCLC, but the nurse that we had, um, her name was Pam. She, the first thing she said when she came in, because I ended up having a C-section because he was a very big baby um, Mm. and I had significant blood loss. So I was very out of it. She came in and she was like, look, I know you're a lactation consultant, but with your own baby, which I was in love with this, that she was even saying this to me. She was like, but your own baby is different. And so I'm still going to, like you said, give you some support. And I was like all for it. I was like, yes, please. Like kind of, I don't remember everything because I just experienced this attic surgery and she was great. She was perfect. She, I don't feel like she hounded me on things. I feel like she reminded me about a couple things that I would have reminded a client But at the time, I just didn't remember because it was my own baby. And it's like the situation of when you're a babysitter, you're like, oh, yeah, I've been with kids. And once it's your own kid, though, it's completely different than babysitting. So, yeah, they were. Yeah. Was this your first C-section? This was my first C-section. Okay, yeah. So that's even different. Oh, like, right. So that helped plenty of people. Yep. Yeah. Completely different. I hats off to Pam for acknowledging that you knew your stuff, but also saying, I'm not going to forget about you. I'm going to provide you the same care I would anybody else. Was Pam an IBCLC or was she? She she was actually. And uh, she even called me a couple months after the birth to double check on how I was doing. And I told her, please keep doing that to all your Mm -hmm. other moms and babies because I'm it just, it meant a lot. Like it, yeah. it totally meant a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And when you are the IBCLC, it can be so easy for people to say she knows what she's doing. Pediatricians experience the same thing. They yeah. might not get as good of support as they would get had somebody not known they were a pediatrician. But as we all know, pediatricians do not receive baby feeding education in school beyond just a few hours. Yeah. And so most of what they teach their patients is just based on what they've seen in their clinic or quick looking up of the research. So yeah, it's really important for us to take that step back and say, regardless of your profession, I'm going to help you to the best of my ability. And this is a good message for anyone who's listening who has had multiple children too. If you have had two children already, and this is your third baby, I'm still going to come in and provide the same care as I would if it were your first baby. Because as you have demonstrated with your various feeding difficulties, every baby is going to be a new and different experience. So you might know a little bit more about the various positions and holds there are, but it might be more difficult for you to get your baby to open wide, for instance, because your baby, this new baby's body is different compared to your body than your other babies. Yep, exactly. And I've told many clients, um, hey, like each kid is completely different. And it's so true. And I do feel like there is like some part where you're like, "Mm, I don't think so. Like they're sort of all the same, but they're not. They're completely different people. They do ride the same kind of track, but other things get thrown in there. And Mm -hmm. like their personality is completely different than um, their brother or their sister. So um, it's it can be hard sometimes to juggle that and figure out what this child needs. But I do think having that same baseline of care for everybody is really, really important. Um, And I think Pam really nailed it on the head. And she was actually our favorite nurse and uh, people. So my car, my license plate actually says IBCLC. So every... Oh, it does? Yeah. So all of the... um, nurses that were changing shift thought that car was Pam's. So when they came in, they were like, Pam, did you get a new car? Because I think (laughs) she was the only IBCLC in the U. And so we joked around about that. And I told her, I was like, you can tell everybody that it's your new car. It's fine. And yeah, so it was like this fun moment that we had because the birth was definitely really traumatic. And then I did feel still super supported. And even with the amount of blood loss that I had, Um, And just the trauma, our breastfeeding journey started out really well. Um, 
And I feel like it went so well that he really didn't want to take a bottle. Mm. It's, all, it's all different. So luckily in the past couple of weeks, he has finally taken a bottle. Oh, good. But yeah. Yeah. You know, I've had all experience. I would love to. All. Yeah, exactly. I would love to talk to you about that a little bit. I actually have my brain is going in a bunch of different directions, but I do want to ask you about the bottle refusal. But I want to take you back to thinking about all the difficulties that you've had, the severe tongue tie, the swallowing difficulty, the flux. And so now when you are helping clients, I know for me, my, my oldest suffered with severe tongue tie that really never did get resolved. And that was almost 10 years ago. So now we know so much more about it than we did then. Like I never did any oral exercises Mm -hmm. pre or post. Oh, we just didn't know about that. Um, And so now sometimes I feel like I see tongue tie in every baby. And I'm like, why is it me just like putting my own experiences onto this client? Or And then I have to take a step back and say, no, like this is what you've learned. Yeah. This is how you have learned to a, do a functional assessment. Oh, and I go over the functional assessment checklist with the parents and I do the oral assessments. And, oh, and then I have to say, no, you are not coloring what you experienced, you were not coloring this client's experience with your own experiences, but do you have difficulty separating that as an IBCLC? I'm getting a little vulnerable here and I'm inviting you to do the same, but when you're seeing somebody who's struggling with swallowing or struggling with spitting up, is it hard for you to separate your own experience from what they are experiencing or have you found a way to manage that? Really great question. I feel like sometimes I do. It kind of depends on my connection with the client. Like if I if we really connect like right off, then I do tend to feel those kind of feelings come up when I see certain things, especially the reflux, um, just because that was so like out in the open where like the tongue tie, I feel like I have to get like very intimate in that infant's mouth to see it. And then obviously I'm nursing at breast to see how they do. I feel like that's a little bit more intimate. So it takes more stuff to come out for me to have a reaction, if that makes sense. But Mm -hmm. I, I feel like it'll be harder for me if the client doesn't want to do anything about it, if they are like, nah, whatever. And I do respect their decisions, but I can tell that I'm like, ooh, the future could be really difficult. Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I silently have that monologue where I'm just like, well, the future is going to suck. Um, And sometimes I'll try to reintroduce it again when those questions come up. I'm still having pain or there's a lot of damage or something. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, that's probably due to X, Y, Z. A lot of times I'll end up bringing it up, not because I want to cut everybody, but just because it it is impacting their feeding, especially the tongue tie, tongue or lip tie. So it does tend to come up more if it's not resolved, um, just because Mm -hmm. it affects a lot of things. But I do see myself in some of the situations. um, And I just recently saw a client and we had almost the same exact C-section experience. Um, And it was actually in the same hospital too. Uh, That was like very... Um, up, I don't want to say upsetting, but it was triggering in the sense of, wow, obviously tons of people have C-sections, but just hearing the same experience um, and then seeing that she's having um, breastfeeding issues and lactation issues, but also that like really brought up a lot of feelings for me. And I feel like I was more inclined to help this person because um, our stories were very similar. And, uh, but the reflux I feel if a client comes in and their baby's coming all over the place, like I definitely am like, oh my gosh, this is a thing. Like, I believe you that your child is. Mm. I find myself saying like, I believe you that these problems are real. Yes. Because so many other providers, especially pediatricians will write it off or not really address it because they don't know enough about it. So they just Mm -hmm. won't address it. Um, or they'll just write a script and the parent wants their baby to feel better, but they also want to know why is this happening? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Is the why yeah. is very big. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, I often, one of the things I like to do when I'm working with a client who has a very difficult case, 
I just like to say, hey, I want you to know that I see lots of people feeding lots of babies and your experience is truly difficult. And even if I'm not able to help them solve all of their problems, yeah. just hearing somebody who sees a lot of different scenarios of baby feeding say, hey, this is truly difficult. It's not just difficult for you. It is difficult in comparison to how many people are feeding their babies. Because sometimes people think, oh, I'll just switch to bottle and it'll be better. And then their baby still has feeding difficulties yeah. or their baby is still waking every hour at yeah. night. And, you know, and as we're trying to figure out the root causes, which can be so difficult sometimes, um, you know, it, it, they feel so alone and just having someone say, I believe you and it's difficult. Yeah. It truly is difficult. You're not just making this up in your head can help to just relieve a lot of the anxiety of, am I just crazy? Like, why is this so hard? I should be able to feed my baby. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like you probably experienced this too. Like you'll get the like wise and then you'll also get I just want to know that I'm doing everything right. I just want mm -hmm. to know that I have enough milk or that my baby is healthy or I just want to know if I'm doing it okay. And I've recently had a lot of clients kind of look for reassurance and I totally encourage those visits. You don't have to come to me with a problem. You can come to me being like, I just want to know if this position is okay or if this is, if I'm doing it. Because I do feel like we tend to ask that with anything new that we do, whether it's like driving a car or like sewing a quilt or something. Am I doing this right is a completely valid question. And it matters. Mm -hmm. too. Like your need for validation with that totally matters. Uh, yeah, there's it's yeah. a lot. And that's a really great point. That is a great reason to reach out to an IBCLC. If you are feeling any amount of doubt, yeah. you can either see them in person, they can come to you, you can do a virtual visit just to ask some of those nagging questions. And often that will get covered by insurance. For a lot of people, it's like therapy just about your baby. Yeah and just about your baby's feeding because they are such long and intimate visits mm -hmm. that the first thing I do with anybody is just check in. Hey, how are you feeling overall? What are the things you're most concerned about? What are the things that you're feeling good about? Like, so people walk away from appointments, even if they haven't solved a specific difficulty, feeling like I got listened to, I got to ask a lot of questions and have an expert tell me their opinion. And I never say you need to do X, Y, and Z. Same. I always say these are your options. You get to choose from this menu of options, either do nothing or try this adjustment or try that adjustment. And I'm always trying to check in. Do you think this would work for you? Because so many times I hear that people get advice that won't work for their lifestyle. If you're a single mom, for instance, and you have two other kids, you can't do a, a baby moon and be in the bed all day with your baby. That's not realistic. Yeah. So then we have to find other, other ways of helping that person cope with whatever difficulty they're having. Yeah, no, and that's perfect. I think really tailoring your support to specifically um, each client really helps uh, practice thrive because you're not just like a cookie cutter um, provider. You're really like making sure that it's an intimate um, visit and that whatever you're suggesting works for that family. I think that's important. And I definitely get feedback from clients of just, wow, you said so much more than the pediatrician and, and you did so much more. And sometimes I, sometimes at the end of visits, I'll be like, did I do enough? Did I suggest enough? I know. Did I suggest too yeah. much? Was I talking right. too much? <laughs> Was I not I listening? Know. Or did I listen too much and not suggest enough? Like I, I definitely do doubt myself a little bit because it is like a hard profession, but I love doing it. But like it's a very um, like, int like intimate profession. And also I want to get it right the first time, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I think the fact that you are asking yourself those questions after visits shows that you're somebody who has a growth mindset. Um, so many times we meet professionals who are in the perinatal field who aren't willing to say, oh, you know what, I need to change the way I approach that person or um, that visit didn't go exactly how I wanted. Right. Let me make an adjustment. And I think that's a critical part of working with people in the perinatal period. 
Yeah, I agree. Plus, most IBCLCs can help with just about any feeding difficulty. And I always tell people, if I don't know exactly how to help you, I know so many other professionals that I can reach out to and ask questions of and follow back. I'm never going to pretend I know something if I don't. Right. So I will help you, whether it's me directly or me reaching out to somebody else and then coming back to you. But... We all know that the things that we experience, we often become pretty passionate about, and then we're able to then help our clients. So let's say somebody is experiencing lots of swallowing difficulties, or they've had the tongue tie procedure, yet they're not seeing progress, or um, they're dealing with reflux. How can somebody um, reach out to you? Do you work both virtually and in person? Yes. A great question. Yeah. So I do have an office and I do offer office visits, home visits, and virtual visits. Um, So anyone can visit my website, embracinglactation.com. I do accept most insurance plans. I'm currently trying to get in network with more insurances, but I'm sure as you know, that's kind of its own ball. I also, yeah. Oh gosh. Um, I also offer discounts for families receiving state insurance or on WIC. I do tend to like work with those families as well too, if financial uh, is kind of an issue. Um, but you can book online. You can also send me an email on my website as well, or follow me on Instagram at Embracing Lactation. I do also have a YouTube channel that I started like years ago um, when I was pregnant with uh, my second, I think. Um, So it has a lot of free breastfeeding advice. I had, I mainly started it when I was a CBS, so a certified breastfeeding specialist. Um, And so sometimes when people are like, oh, I I want some information, I'll sometimes send them there. So you can check that out as well, too. Um, There's a lot of exclusively pumping advice on there because I actually also specialize in exclusively pumping, too. A lot of, a lot of different hats. But yeah, yeah, reflux, swallowing, really... um, any of those kind of acute issues, I'm more than happy to support families. In. Thank you so much for coming on to share your personal experiences and how that has shaped what you do as an IBCLC. I'm so happy that you're in my area and that uh, hopefully we can meet in person sometime. But this has been a really fun conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, it's been great meeting you. Hopefully we can definitely get together soon in person. The biggest thing I learned from becoming a parent is that we really cannot control other human beings. So it is really good to plan for your childbirth and for how you want your feeding to go because then you know what your options are, you know how to adjust as needed, you know the things that are really important to you and the things that you're willing to bend on as you think through your options. However, Until we have that baby with us in our arms, none of us know how any of it is going to go. We don't know what their temperament is going to be like. We don't know what their body will be like. We don't know how their body will fit with our body. We really can't control how anything in parenting will go. And I've shifted my goals with my children, not to be able to control them, but to be somebody who is there for them through the storms, to be able to model self-regulation so that over time they learn it, and to be able to problem solve together when something comes up that is difficult for us. And when we become parents and we have these little babies in our arms, that really is what the goal is. I often tell my clients, it's not your job to stop all crying. I know I felt that way when I had my first. Anytime there was crying, I felt like I immediately had to stop whatever I was doing and provide the breast. But as they get older, we recognize that we can't stop all crying. We can't end all hurt. We can't prevent all discomfort or all skinned knees or any time our children get into a disagreement or a scuffle with another child. But what I can do is be there for them through the hurt, through the frustration, through the pain, through the difficulty, and it's the same with baby feeding. We can be the calm in the storm for our little babies as they're learning to be new humans in the world. And this story really demonstrates that we never know what's going to happen and that having the right professionals by your side to help guide the choices that you make 
to help you understand the root causes of your difficulties and to give you ways of managing those difficulties can go a long way. So if you would like to reach out to Kim or myself to get insight into your breastfeeding difficulties, either one of us would love to see you. Whether you are still pregnant and would like some prenatal counseling, whether you are planning to exclusively pump, or whether you are already in the thick of it and you either just need some extra guidance, some reassurance, or need help solving a very difficult case. Whatever it may be, we're here for you. We can't wait to help you. And we'll talk to you soon.